the reason I'm coming from this perspective is I want to give us a different idea about the season of Lent. Often Lent is characterized by what we do at the very beginning of that season, which is um, Ash Wednesday. And so the season of Lent takes on a very penitential feel. But that is a later emphasis on Lent. In fact, our earliest understanding of how Lent develops is being connected with baptismal preparation. For those going for adult baptism, usually at the Easter Vigil, would, they would spend the period of Lent in intense preparation, intense renewal, turning away from their old ways of life and living a new, uh, in preparation for their new life in Christ. And so as we continue during our season of Lent, where we have various Lenten disciplines, I want us to think more about the renewal of baptism in our disciplines. And so here, it makes sense for me to be out near the water, as water is an important part of our baptismal renewal. It is that element, that thing that Luther says in his large catechism, that thing to which our faith can cling. It is that external, the thinginess of God's grace. So during the season of Lent, I've been biking three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, um, which coincidentally are also the days on which early Christians prayed, as we know in a text called the Didache from the first to second century. And I bike along the San Francisco Bay Trail, not just because it's flat and that works well on my knees, um, or because there's a nice breeze that comes off the bay, which keeps me cool, but because I'm close to the water. I can reflect on my baptism, and I can reflect on the goodness of creation, the creation that God said is good at the very beginning of Genesis, and my work and my own stewardship of that creation. One of the texts that gives us a sense of early Christian prayer is the Didache, which is a uh, first or even early second century church order, possibly written around the time of the Gospel of Matthew for an earlier dating, or the Gospel of John for a later dating. In this text, probably from the Syrian Christ, early Syrian Christian tradition, details how that particular community um, functions together as a Christian community. It's really in three parts. The first part is about what does it mean to live as a Christian? So that's the ethical exhortations. The second part deals with the ritual practices of the community including prayer, baptism, and celebrating the Eucharist. And in the third part are more of the logistics of what it means to be a Christian community, including how to welcome those who wander in and how to organize leadership. But for us, the important text really is in chapter 8, where it details prayer. It specifically mentions that Christians fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. And we can assume that such fasting included more prayer practices as well. In chapter 8, it also gives us one of the earliest, if not the earliest, text of the Lord's Prayer outside the Gospel tradition. And it tells the community that being in prayer means to pray three times a day. The text from the Didache then um, it, about prayer in chapter 8 is sandwiched right between baptism in chapter 7 and Eucharist in chapters 9 and 10. But specifically, let's look at the origins of Lent and how this may connect to our understanding of prayer, especially as it relates to baptism. So our earliest origins of Lent um, from what we can tell, Lent was a period distinct from Holy Week. Holy Week had its own character and its own proximity to Easter, and various days of Holy Week took on special significance, as we see it in our current celebrations. This period 
of Lent, or what would be considered Lent now, is really tied up with the catechumenate. And the catechumenate is a process for preparing uh, early Christians um, in the early church. And so this was a, a period of maybe three weeks to 40 days. Uh, one text, the Apostolic Tradition, says three years, although it's unclear if that text was someone's hope or if it was how a community actually lived. And so Lent was this intense preparation for baptism, the baptism of adults, which would happen at the Easter Vigil. And in this period of intense preparation, we have the disciplines of prayer, fasting, instruction, including instruction on the ideas of what would eventually be considered the creed, as well as various exorcisms, not the um, spinning your head, shooting out pea soup type of exorcisms, but more really a call to amend one's life and to live a Christian life is a spiritual discipline of prayer that is important. So prayer is tied with the preparation and the formation of baptism. Later in the catechumenate, we'll see specifically on the third, fourth, and fifth weeks of Lent, uh, specific emphases would happen, including the handing over of the creed, which would be the Apostles' Creed, the renunciation of evil, and the commitment of prayer, where the handing over of the Lord's Prayer, because as these early, um, not yet Christians, uh, are preparing to become Christians, they are given the tools of the Christian life, including the Creed and the Lord's Prayer. There were also other layers of purpose for the season of Lent which all coalesce after the Council of Nicaea. The first layer I just described is the final preparation for baptismal candidates. The second, the preparation of those undergoing um, public penance, and that would be reconciled back into the community after a minor exorcism at what would become Ash Wednesday later on, would be reconciled back to the community. And then a pre-Paschal fasting, or really looking specifically toward Good Friday and Easter. When adult baptisms start to decline, especially at the 5th and 6th century, with the, um, the spread of the doctrine of original sin, which also meant the spread of infant baptism, the penitential and the fasting layers of Lent really become the primary or sole layers of baptism, and we still see that today. We see our Lenten season marked with the beginning of Ash Wednesday, which really gives a tone for the whole season, and the idea of it being a pre-Paschal fast is that most people see Lent almost as a 40-day Good Friday, where it's always solely looking to the cross, pointing ahead, rather than seeing Lent as its own um, liturgical season. So how might we, during this Lenten season, engage in those practices of prayer? Well, like I said, in the D.K., we have the call for daily prayer happening three times a day. And as we would see in later traditions, that would be morning, noon, and night. Many of us are uh, familiar with morning and evening prayer, especially evening prayer during Lent, uh, Vespers, um, using uh, Holden Evening Prayer or our Unfailing Light or other um, popular versions of Vespers. And so we're familiar with that daily prayer practice. But that it doesn't need to be as complicated. Really, we see early on with the daily practices of prayer, two approaches. The first would be con could be considered the monastic approach. And the reason for this was because it was uh, primarily associated with monastic communities. And the goal is to go through the entire Psalter, all 150 Psalms each week, 
And as you can see from my square on the, Lent, the ULS Lenten sampler, that was my goal for this Lenten period. And you would begin and can end that, that period of uh, monastic prayer with, uh, with prayer itself. You could use Luther's morning or evening prayer at the beginning, and you could conclude with the Lord's Prayer. But ideally, the monastic approach is characterized by silence. It's that it's not a lot of ritual practice, it's not a lot of text, but it's really an opportunity to be in silence. I think when I'm riding my bike, um, that's kind of what I engage in, although I can hear people around me, I can hear um, certainly the water and the breeze, but it's really an opportunity to distance myself from those things that create noise, either physical audible noise or cognitive noise by being on my bicycle. The other primary approach to daily prayer is the cathedral approach, and this was meant to happen in larger settings like cathedrals, and this is what like in the ELW or in Hold an Evening Prayer, that is the cathedral approach. So you have an increased use of ritual. Morning prayer often included an opportunity for baptismal renewal. And in the evening, you have the lighting of the lamps or the lighting of the candles, which we see currently in Vespers. But we can really see between these two a hybrid approach where we could bring some of those rituals like baptismal renewal even into our more modest monastic approach of morning prayer and bring the lighting of candles into our evening practices of prayer. So as I mentioned in ELW, you can use Luther's morning and evening prayer texts. Those are um, can be found in the morning and evening prayer rites or in the small catechism at the back, where it is in the singular, um, I, rather than the plural, we, if you are by yourself. Another way to do that, to kind of find a hybrid approach between the monastic simplicity and the cathedral ritual, would be to engage in the responsive prayer texts from the ELW. And in there you see the use of the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, various verses of psalms, and then a prayer specific to the time of day, morning, noon, afternoon, evening, and for daily work and travel. Of course, our worship resources like LBW, ELW, and the brand new All Creation Sings provides additional petitions and intercessions that can be included in your prayer if you want to give each day a particular emphasis. And then for those of you who have that charism, you can write or speak your own prayer instead of what is in the book. And there's really two approaches. There is what's often the Acts approach, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Or there's the five-part format of a prayer, the collect form, which is what we see in our prayers of the day, beginning with an address to God, then an attribute of God, then the actual petition, why you're asking for the petition, and then the conclusion. So those of you who may be Monty Python fans and recall from the, the movie The Meaning of Life when they're in the... Uh, um, chapel of the boys school that prayer oh lord you are so big follows that form oh lord you are so big forgive us our dreadful toting the fourth one kind of so that we may live as you would design through jesus christ our lord so that's my ad adaptation of that prayer so that's that five part format and then, of course, there's to bring in that ritual practice of baptismal renewal. And I would suggest that the easiest way to do that would be to adapt the ELW affirmation of baptism or the LBW affirmation of baptism. 
and use it for individual or household use. And so if you're by yourself, you kind of, rather than asking yourself the questions, you can say the question in the affirmative. If you're in your household, one person could ask the questions and the members of the household would answer. Along with that ritual, uh, those ritual texts, you can bring in ritual objects, like a container of water, not because you are rebaptizing, but so that you have that visual and even that feeling aspect of water connecting to the thinginess of baptism, that to which our faith can cling, as Luther says in the large catechism. And then you can light a candle. You may have your baptismal candle around that you would light at your baptismal anniversary. You could light that, or you could light any candle. I mean, everyone has candles around. And it's not necessarily doing this one time, but really if we to see Lent as an entire period of baptismal renewal in preparation for Easter, if we want to bring in those various layers of bapt or those various layers of Lent, this isn't something that's just a one time only. To connect this with worship that happens online or worship that happens um, in a parking lot uh, or those who are able to start going back to in-person worship, you can find ways of making the connection to the larger worshiping community by having people engage in these practices together. It may be that you schedule a particular Sunday in Lent where you have this baptismal renewal in which people online and offline can join together.